afternoon, everybody. So Deb and I are sharing this talk because we shared the project. And my job is to start is to introduce how we got to the point where we started with the exhibition in the summer of 2018. And Deb is going to talk about the exhibition and all the outreach and education and things that went with it. So I work in the Archive and Archaeology Service, which is based in the Hive in Worcester City Centre, just six minutes walk from the Worcester Art Gallery and Museum. Um, we have the HER and we also have the archive. The Hive is a, I think a £65 million building that was purpose built to house the university library, the public library and the original archives. It's also got the, the Worcestershire hub, which is the like placement for the job centre and the council tax and all that kind of stuff in there as well. So we get a lot of visitors through the door for other things as well as um, archive and archaeology. So it's a fantastic place to showcase archaeology and um, get lots and lots of visitors. The Hive has, I think, a million visits a year through the door. Um, and we're six minutes walks from the Museum and Art Gallery. My job is um, development management archaeologist and where I work in Worcestershire, we have historically not had much of um, a Paleolithic presence. When we started in 2013, Historic England put out a call for uh, projects looking at improving Paleolithic and Mesolithic understanding of HERs in HERs. And at that point, we had 10 artefacts in the HER of Paleolithic date, um, all hand axes, and around about 30 records for environmental or faunal remains. And the Paleolithic is a period that's actually quite hard to connect with. It's very easy to engage people with the idea of mammoths and ice age, but when you start looking at the people, it becomes a little harder to, to because it's so complicated and you have to have such an understanding about quaternary geology, or quaternary science and geology. And um, so as a curating archeologist in the um, planning process, I didn't have much an idea about when it would be appropriate to uh, ask for inf further information or um, archeological research into Paleolithic archaeology and I didn't have the evidence either. You can't ask people to do huge excavations or look for stuff when you have 10 artefacts in the whole county. So we started this project called Putting the Paleolithic in Worcestershire's HER. We reassessed all of the existing material in existing collections. So we started with a literature review and we had a specialist in um, environmental archaeology and quaternary science who went through all the literature, not just the archaeological literature, but also the um, geological literature and quaternary science literature to try and get a, a really good handle on everything that has actually been found out about Paleolithic material and the Pleistocene environment in Worcestershire in the past um, sort of couple of hundred years of research. We contacted um, all the other museums that we thought might hold Paleolithic material of Worcestershire to find out what they'd got. And we also got um, a specialist, Paleolithic specialist, Dr. Andrew Shaw, to reassess all the known artifacts that we could get hold of. So there's stuff in Worcestershire museum collections um, that wasn't previously in the HER but was known about. And then there was all sorts of things that we found out about in other museums and other collections that we didn't know existed beforehand. Um, where we could, we got Dr. Andrew Shaw to look at them and evaluate them. And he established that around about 261 of the 300 possible artifacts were um, in fact Paleolithic and they were all pulled into the HER. The other thing we wanted to do was try and get a better idea about um, where we should be looking for Paleolithic archaeology and Pleistocene faunal environmental remains in the future. 
So particularly with sort of quarry sites, we're going to have a lot of quarrying coming forward in the next 10, 20 years in Worcestershire along the river terraces. And where in that area are we likely to find these sites, these faunal remains? And so what we ended up with was areas of Paleolithic potential based on known archaeological evidence, the geological evidence from um, the BGS, and we have all the fine spots of lithic and faunal remains. And what we've ended up with is, a, is 21 areas of Paleolithic potential where we think there's likely to be more further remains. We've now got around 2,200 records of environmental and faunal remains in the HER, which has gone up from about 30. And we've also now got around about, it was 261 when the project finished, I think it's 279 now, Paleolithic finds, which obviously is nothing compared to the kind of finds you get down in the southeast, where you have a huge, far more evidence. But it gives us up in the up in the Midlands a much better understanding of where we might have the, the information and and how to go about finding it. The other thing we have now within the HER for people like me who don't who aren't specialists and don't know much about it is descriptions of each of the marine mm. oxygen isotope stages with what you might what is likely to have come from nationally, what the landscape was like nationally, and what it was like in Worcestershire, where the evidence comes from in Worcestershire. So we know, for example, now that at Eckington, which is mentioned up there, we've got remains of hippopotamus, mammoth, giant deer, and we also know that those remains are in places only a metre or so below the surface, so it's not just quarrying where you might find um, important remains. It might be fairly sort of nor what you call normal developments that might find these um, this information. But throughout the project, we came across all these lovely stories and all this information that was previously not known. It was obviously all there, but it was all disparate and it's all been pulled together. And we sat down and we had this meeting after the Historic England project um, concluded. I think it was Deborah's idea um, that we should do some public outreach, some exhibitions, some engagement to actually tell these stories. So we've got evidence of lions on Breeden Hill. We've got bones that have been showed evidence of human um, butchery in Worcestershire, which we didn't know we had until Whitehead's collection down in the British Museum was reassessed and that information came to light. So we all sat down in a room and we looked at the information that we got and we had a brainstorming session about what we could do. We got a little bit carried away with mammoth balloons taking off from the race course and uh, mini mammoths all around the city. But eventually we came down to quite a good um, set of, of research objectives uh, ev um, and outreach and stories that we wanted to tell. And so we got together a group of partnerships, and I think this is the real strength of the project, is that we had a lot of specialists. So we had people from the Herefordshire and Worcestershire Earth Heritage Trust on board who are geologists, one of whom specialised in superficial deposits in, Worc in Worcestershire in the West Midlands. So had all that knowledge of the BGS data. Um, Nick Duffin, who was involved in the original project, worked for us when he was involved in the original project, but then he left, but he came back as an individual to give his time for free. He's a palynologist and an environmental archaeologist with a particular interest in the quaternary geology of Worcestershire. So he came on board to help with all the research and the information. And then the Hive Museums Worcestershire. And the Hive applied for Arts Council England funding to run an arts project associated with our Heritage Lottery Fund, as it was called then, project that we applied for. Um, so we applied for a Heritage Lottery Fund to do research, uh, curation and improvement of the collections and um, uh, exhibitions, education and outreach, which Deb is now going to talk a little bit more about.
Um, so, uh, as Emma was saying, there were some uh, wonderful stories um, that came from our original uh, Historic England project. Um, and uh, uh, kind of all the planets, uh, the stars aligned on, on this project in that there'd been a recent restructure at the Museum and Art Gallery where archaeology and natural history were put together for the first time. Um, in one job role. And um, the Ice Age is a wonderful opportunity to uh, uh, spin both of those plates at the same time. Um, we have, uh, we have uh, Pleistocene um, geology collections, Paleolithic archaeology collections. Um, many of them are antiquarian, the vast majority. Um, Worcester City Museum is the uh, eighth oldest museum in the country. Um, it was collecting from the 1820s and 30s. And, um, and so much of this collection was a mass actually before anyone who was uh, collecting it had a clear view of time depth, of uh, the significance of Ice Age, uh, of the Ice Age, and, and, and even before, you know, texts like Origin of Species were, were, were published. Um, and um, uh, the sad thing is that most of the collection had not been re-evaluated or re-identified since it was collected in the 1830s and 40s. So we, re we really, until this project came along, had very little idea what we were dealing with. So we got material from the county itself. Um, the, uh, these finds were collected by a tailor from St. John's in Worcester called uh, uh, William Bruton. Um, he, uh, he didn't know uh, exactly what he was looking at, it would seem, um, but a curator of the museum uh, called W.H. Edwards, who went on to work at Birmingham Museum and Art Gallery, um, did realise uh, what these objects were in the 1920s. And um, in fact, um, as a sort of precursor to the HER project, um, he published these in the 1920s um, into, a, in, into an arena where it was considered that there were no Paleolithic finds sort of north of a line that went from the Bristol Channel to the, to the Wash. So they caused quite a stir at the time. We've got some um, lovely uh, European material as well. Um, we've got finds from the European type sites, uh, um, Le Moustier, Aurignac and, and others. Um, this uh, cave, uh, portion of cave floor uh, came from a site in Les Ize, uh, and, is, um, and was exciting because it was obviously collected by, as you can see, Lartet and Christie. Um, two archaeologists, uh, well, funder and archaeologists, who went on to um, uh, discover what they called the uh, uh, Cro-Magnon Man and um, also uh, a beautiful engraving of a mammoth on, I think, bone or ivory that proved for the first time that man and mammoth lived side by side. Um, and as, as, like all good museum archaeologists, obviously I took my entire family on a holiday to the Dordogne in the summer of 2017 and dragged three teenagers um, through somebody's back garden and up a hill to find uh, Richard's cave where the, the cave floor was, um, was excavated. Uh, so, um, uh, the European material particularly, I think, that we found exciting. Um, but uh, uh, what we hadn't appreciated, I think, was that um, uh, we got a collection from around the world. So, uh, this is a giant wombat with a bloke for scale. <laughs> Um, there was a moment, uh, and it was within about a two-week period, where we realised we'd got a moose in the attic and a giant wombat in the basement, which, you know, that's what we all go to work for, isn't it? It's wonderful. Um, so uh, they lived uh, um, uh, uh, up until about 25,000 years ago when they went extinct. Um, our uh, giant wombat came from Queensland, from the area of Darling Downs, um, and is a rather special specimen. Um, so, uh, a chap called Henry Hughes and uh, two of his associates, the Isaac brothers, went out to um, Australia in the 1840s and um, they settled initially in uh, Sydney and then were amongst the first couple of uh, two or three uh, squatters who went out to settle Queensland in really a very difficult time in Australia's um, history and actually the Isaac brothers particularly were uh, implicated in some um, terrible crimes and atrocities against indigenous populations. Um, but they sent home um, an enormous amount of boomerangs <laughs> and basketry and all the other things you would expect. Um, and also uh, uh, some of this fossil evidence um, from um, uh, Diptrodon. And, uh, and the Worcester examples 
uh, were analysed uh, by um, Richard Owen, of course, um, of Natural History Museum and Dinosaur fame. Um, and actually, our specimens were the, the first that he um, drew and published of this, uh, uh, of this particular uh, um, animal. So, um, really, the more we dug, the more we found that, that there were stories that we should tell. Um, just before we started the um, project, the City Museum got its first donation of um, Ice Age natural history in about 150 years, we reckon, um, at a tarmac quarry just um, outside Worcester at Clifton. Uh, um, a chap uh, driving the excavator uh, spotted uh, this wonderful um, tusk and um, really all credit to tarmac. Uh, they called Worcester Archive and Archaeology Service in. Um, they paid for post ex, they uh, um, uh, paid for conservation, and they um, uh, and then in then deposited with the museum. Um, uh, so uh, this object came in while our marketing team was on holiday, every single one of them. So we took over the social media feed <laughs> for the entire month and, um, and did very, very well indeed. So as uh, Emma was saying, the, the other problem with people who are obviously working on uh, any period display is that your collections are probably dispersed and ours were no different. They were across a number of institutions. There was quite a large collection um, that was largely inaccessible in the Natural History Museum, um, a small but really good quality collection in the Almonry. Wonderful objects from Upton Warren at the Lapworth Museum, um, a, a, a type site which has given its name to a um, an interstadial warmer period about 50,000 years ago. Um, interesting because um, I, I think more and more people um, are, are, who knows about these things are, are thinking that it's, uh, it, it's not dated to the right period at all. And um, obviously then material also in the Portable Antiquities Scheme. So uh, I think Emma's been through all this. So obviously um, the, the, uh, the funding meant that we were able to look at this period from all conceivable angles. So it paid um, for a project officer, for exhibitions, activities, school packs. Um, most importantly, it, it paid for professional support. And for us, really, because this period was so difficult and so complicated, and, um, and we struggled to understand it, we needed the help of specialists to understand enough so that we could um, clearly uh, interpret this period um, uh, for our audience. So um, our wonderful project officer, Rob Hedge, who should be probably here doing this, um, uh, who uh, um, can tell a story like no one I've ever met and um, who will stay up till the early hours of the morning to make sure his identification is bang on. Um, he worked on the project for 18 months, along with a whole host of other people, archaeologists, geologists, academics, photographers, illustrators. Um, it, that, that kind of resource is just uh, not available to us at all um, in, in a normal project. And so um, we worked with um, uh, artists and illustrators because uh, we wanted people to be able to visualise these animals and landscapes that obviously they can no longer see. Uh, Peter Lorimer uh, worked on the reconstruction of a group from Worcestershire um, uh, um, that was excavated in the 1990s and he produced these wonderful animals for us. Um, but the, the jewel in the crown really was this, um, it, it was like a 360 uh, VR image of a landscape at Strencham, uh, ne actually next to Strencham services on the M5 <laughs> about 200,000 years ago. And so uh, he worked off an uh, excavation report um, from, by, written by Worcestershire Archive and Archaeology Service. So every animal, you know, every plant, everything, the detail is, is all evidenced within that report. Um, and uh, um, uh, as, you, as you sort of uh, do the 360 VR, uh, other animals come into focus as you turn around. It's just wonderful. We were also uh, aware that uh, we had um, problems with um, uh, just how complicated um, our human history has been. Um, particularly terminology is difficult. Um, these were summer exhibitions, so we were talking to a family audience. And so we worked with um, a comic book artist uh, called Andy Watson, um, who once worked on Buffy the Vampire Slayer and is now <laughs> um, uh, uh, yeah, drawing uh, cavemen. 
Um, so uh, from left to right, we've got Australopithecus, Heidelbergensis, Neanderthal, and obviously modern humans. Um, and although they look like cheery people, um, with, without much thought gone into them, that these went backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards to try and get as, uh, uh, as accurate as possible. Um, he also designed for us a uh, hippo, so uh, to indicate when we're talking about warm periods, a mammoth to talk about when we were talking about cold periods, um, an antiquarian who uh, told us about um, uh, understanding of the Ice Age during the 19th century, and, and this sort of precocious modern girl archaeologist who put him right whenever he got something wrong. We worked with um, Adam uh, at Aerial Cam, who took uh, aerial photographs um, of um, landscape features from the county that were formed during the Ice Age. So um, he worked uh, with the support of um, geologists um, from Hereford and Worcester Earth Heritage Trust. Um, we went out on Land Rover safaris. And uh, these were taken in the winter of 2007, when, if you remember, it snowed about every three to four weeks. So um, we were incredibly lucky, actually, with the weather. Uh, this is a view across the top of the Malden Hills. And we wanted um, our visitors to be able to um, uh, touch and, and feel some of the most precious objects that we had. Um, and in order to be able to do that to a wider audience as possible, we work with uh, Think C3D in order to make um, 3D um, printed copies of, uh, of some of our um, most precious hand axes. The project also paid to do um, a, a, a good deal of collections work. So um, I mentioned we've got a moose head in the attic and a wombat in the basement. So this is the moose from the attic. So this, um, this specimen had gone up to the attic in, in the 1930s. Um, over the intervening 80 years, there had been quite a lot of building work, so he was essentially trapped. Um, so, um, uh, I mean, we had to close the street to do this, so we had to demolish part of the attic and take the thing over the top of the museum on a terry picker and, um, and down the other side. And then we uh, were also able to engage um, Simon Moore, um, a conservator, who gave our uh, staff training, not only in cleaning the moose head, um, but also uh, some other um, specimens as well. Um, he taught Kate here how to use shampoo a polar bear, uh, which was um, uh, which was amazing. That was in about her second week at work. Um, uh, we were able to preserve some of our uh, fossil remains as well. This is a, um, an auroch skull that was donated by Hugh Strickland. Um, and we gave uh, Nigel Larkin a box of bits. Um, uh, he, man he managed to um, uh, um, uh, uh, reconstruct it really rather beautifully. And so we had two exhibitions, one at the museum and one at the hive, both in the summer holidays, both with a family audience. I aim to say these were not our panel titles. Um, uh, but uh, we ended up with basically 10 themes and as a centrepiece this enormous um, uh, mammoth model that we borrowed from Dudley Museum and Art, Art Gallery, um, uh, who they call Fluffy. Um, he was enormous. He, 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 we wanted people to have a sense of just how massive these animals were and um, uh, nobody cried, uh, which was one of our biggest fears. So the exhibition was much about doing things as reading and looking at things. So you could climb inside an Ice Age shelter and read books about the Ice Age with your family. You could dress up as animals that used to roam uh, the Worcestershire countryside and, and you could work in the um, finds lab. Um, our exhibition at the Hive concentrated more on the collectors, uh, both antiquarian and modern, um, and also the story of, of humans, really. Uh, it was called The Origins of Us. Um, the museum exhibition had uh, borrowed an original William Smith map. Um, the problem is it was just right in the middle and it's massive, so you couldn't actually get to it. The hive had this amazing and massive uh, printed floor covering so that uh, you could walk over it, crawl over it, look at it from through the atrium uh, from the top floor. Um, and of course, this amazing artwork uh, funded by Arts Council. Um, uh, which was like an installation within a purpose-built room on projectors uh, with, um, it was called Through the Mist of Time. So you get these sort of, sort of uh, shamanic figures and cave paintings coming to life. 
um, which was really incredible. And uh, over the 18 months alongside the exhibitions, uh, we had um, school sessions, resources, workshops, talks. Here a boutique cave painting workshop. Um, this is a school group in our art gallery. And John Law did public demonstrations in flint mapping, but also trained some of our archaeologists as well. And throughout, we, we, um, we told as many people as possible what we were learning along the way. So we had... Uh, we communicated uh, through a website, which is, which is um, uh, still there. You can go to it. Um, uh, we have a weekly column in the Worcester News, um, blogs at both the Archaeology Service and, uh, and at the Museum Service. And this was our reach. So we, we, end up, um, to, uh, we ended up with uh, um, just shy of uh, uh, 180,000 people coming to see the um, exhibitions. Um, uh, we um, uh, had great Facebook reach and Twitter reach. And um, uh, obviously, uh, um, uh, one of the very pleasing things to see, as you could see, is that uh, a good proportion of the visitors were new to the museum. Uh, we, it was one of the things that we hoped would happen by partnering with another site, that there would be some sort of overlap, um, and, and that did come to be. Uh, we've talked a lot since it, um, we all absolutely loved working on this project. It, it ended far too early, but, and we've talked a lot about um, what more really we should have done or what we should have done differently. And, um, and, and, and the, I think the top point every time is we should have asked for more money to do more stuff. Um, uh, we um, we uh, didn't think uh, very clearly about the size of the two exhibitions relative to each other. One was in a, uh, essentially a, a library space, uh, the other in the museum. Um, we should have had a much bigger offer in, in the Hive um, than we actually did. Um, uh, we... Um, we came into some problems that I think everybody does around evaluation and capacity and who would do that. That was us not thinking clearly about the project officer. Um, and there are still an awful lot of research objectives that we don't really know about. Um, we don't know why uh, there are rhino teeth half... Oh, sorry. We don't know why there are rhino teeth halfway up the Malvern Hills. Um, we don't know if there are caves under Breeden Hill. Apparently, um, ladies in the Victorian period went and looked round them. Um, and, uh, and, um, and that's frustrating, I think, when you have uh, um, uh, put so much time and effort into a, into a project over such a long period of time. We have essentially ended with almost as many questions as we started with, um, because we now know so much more. That's it. Thank you.